Bob Spear here tonight. Um, he is the chief scientist uh, for Luminoso. Uh, they have an office based out of Boston here, and they are helping companies uh, leverage their data. So uh, let's give them a warm welcome. So uh, we're a natural language processing company. Uh, so we call ourselves a uh, text understanding company. And you know, the point is that uh, companies have a lot of text data that they might not get around to reading. Uh, and some of it's kind of important. You know, it's like customer feedback, it's uh, you know, customer service requests, it's reviews, it's things like that. Um, and if you can have an automated way to read that and measure it and produce insights from it, then you're getting value from it where you wouldn't have gotten value before. And so that's the kind of thing that we focus on at Luminoso. Um, and so we're going to talk prepared for this theme of AI in the wild. Um, I've got you know, uh, you know, some different topics I can cover here, and uh, you know, got a bunch of things to say, and I picked some order to say them in. And we start out with this, you know, optimistic view of uh, being a uh, small business doing NLP. Uh, that there is lots of things that can be done with NLP right now, kind of everything coming in here. And I'm going to tell you about what you know what Luminoso does in particular. Um, and I'm going to say a bunch of things about how. Uh, NLP in the wild, like, you know, real text in kind of the real world looks kind of different from what you might learn about NLP, you know, uh, you know, in academia. Uh, I'm going to give you a demo of our platform, and we're going to end by talking about some of the open data and open source tools that we've produced. Uh, we try to open up stuff that is not part of our business because we want NLP to work better in general. Um, so. Uh, like I was saying, there's a lot about NLP that's uh, up in the air right now. Um, there's you know a lot of things you can do, and some of them just haven't been done yet. Uh, you know, there's kind of a lot of viable representations, and not everything has been tried with all these different representations. Uh, so a lot of people are just assuming that there's a right thing to do in NLP, and that whoever does it best is going to be the one with the biggest server farm and the most data. And you know that actually I think turns out not to be the case. That you just have to Find a representation that solves your problem well, and you could be doing better at it than you know than Google. Um, there's a lot you can do as long as you have big enough, good enough data. Um, and so, like to, to elaborate on that, like you know, there's a lot of fields that have, that are being revolutionized by you know by all this deep learning technology coming out, and deep learning has also definitely hit NLP. Uh, and there are some problems that it particularly helps with. And some problems where nobody's quite sure yet how to apply it. Um, and when you're working with NLP, you can use all the new deep learning stuff. You can ignore all the new deep learning stuff. You can you know, look at a particular system that uses deep learning to solve a problem well and drill down into it and figure out what it's learning that it wouldn't have learned otherwise, and then just rip that piece out and use it as a function. Um, that, that's a trick that works pretty well sometimes. Um, and so the, you know, the, the key optimistic to me point I want to make here is that you don't have to work at a mega corporation. You don't have to be at Google or IBM or, or Microsoft or whatever uh, to do powerful things with language. Uh, another thing I want to mention is that uh, not everything is big data. Like everyone wants to, everyone likes to talk about big data and like imagine that's like anything you do has to be you know distributed and you know <coughs> so much data you couldn't possibly manage it unless you move the code to the data and use all all these new frameworks that uh, uh, change every year. Um, and so I have this sitting on my desk. It's a you know a USB drive with the full text of Wikipedia and four languages on it. Um, uh, all the data I've ever needed to use, which is you know a couple terabytes, uh, fits on a hard disk that I got from Micro Center. Um, you know, uh, text doesn't really take up a lot of space. Uh, so, um, so you know, there's all these big data frameworks. If you're doing like, if you're doing astrophysics, you're, if you've got like a terabyte of data every second, then yeah, you need these, you know, then you need these big data tools. Um, if you're doing NLP, you just need a good build process that can run on one computer. Um, and uh, well, I was talking actually, I was talking about you know these terabytes of data, and there's this. Uh, I'll get into more detail about this, but there's this approach we take at Luminoso, which is that uh, like each individual customer is not going to have terabytes of data. Um, like they're going to have a hard time putting together you know even gigabytes of it. And even if you find, you know, someone who's sitting on a gold mine of text data, 
you know, they're not going to let us see it all at first. They want us to do a pilot project and all that kind of stuff. You get, uh, to work in the enterprise, you actually have to be able to scale down. Um, you have to be able to deal with incomplete information. You have to be able to fill in the blanks. Um, and so our approach at Luminoso is that uh, we take in the terabytes of data that's about everything, learn from that first, and then take in a small amount of data from the customer uh, to specialize it to their domain. So, to talk about our approach to NLP, I'm going to talk, start by talking about uh, what we don't do. And I'm going to do that by making uh, an analogy to a widely you know, reviled model of software development, the uh, a waterfall model. Um, so, you know, we've had this you know, revolution in agile software development, and, you know, uh, to talk about what's replacing, you talk about the software model, where you have this, you know, structured sequence of steps you develop your software in, and you do one step, and then you do the next step, and you never, and you never go back, uh, which is a problem in the real world, because by the time you get to step five, you realize what you should have designed differently in step two, and you have to start all over, or deliver the wrong thing, or whatever. And so, lots of people have learned that the waterfall model is a bad idea for software, and that you need to have this idea of rapid iteration. I feel like this idea of rapid iteration has not caught on that widely in NLP. Um, and so if you were to ask someone, like, uh, maybe I'm being a little harsh to them, but if you were to ask, like, IBM, uh, how to do NLP, they're going to tell you, well, you need to hire a bunch of consultants, and you need to spend man years designing the, the right ontology, um, and you need a really powerful language model that's, you know, got the right kind of language in it for your domain, and you need to collect a million examples of labeled data, and, you know, uh, and in the end, you know, you don't get quite the right things, you also need to write a bunch of rules that fix the results. Um, and... Uh, a lot of the customers that we get are people who have been through like some number of steps in this process and just given up and want to try something different. Because uh, at Luminoso, we do uh, what I think is a lot more like Agile NLP. Uh, you've got rapid, you've got rapid iteration, um, and the key thing here is that there have to be steps in the system that can be run unsupervised and very quickly. You want to get results quickly and iterate on them. And so I've been talking about the uh, general approach. Uh, here's a diagram of kind of the, the sequence of steps to produce a Luminoso project. Um, start out with a powerful set of background knowledge. Uh, that's our job. The customer doesn't have to deal with producing that. Um, <coughs> then we take customer data and run it through our language pipeline. Uh, just a bunch of NL NLP tools put together. I'll talk about how some of that works. Um, and in the end, we do you know, machine learning uh, that combines what we got out of the language pipeline with the background knowledge to produce, uh, to produce a model of what the customer's language means that didn't have to learn the entire language from scratch from the customer's data. So we just have to, all we have left to do when the customer uploads their data is the domain specific part. It was kind of fun that I was just uh, browsing around on Twitter and I saw you know, a few computational linguists that I follow basically make the business case for Luminoso while they had no idea what Luminoso is. Um, so uh, you have Goldberg here is saying it's kind of interesting that all large bodies interested in NLP, no matter what their core business is, end up wanting the exact same use case. Um, talking about, you know, you've got a large collection of logs, chats, interactions, transcripts. They're messy, they use specialized language. You, you need to sort them, you need to indicate trends over them, and all this kind of stuff. And, yeah, that's, that's what we do. That's, uh, and that's what our tools focus on. So, uh, now I'm going to get into uh, Luminoso and where we came from. So, uh, this is the MIT Media Lab, although it uh, it didn't look this cool for most of the time we were there. Uh, <laughs> uh, so um, we were the common sense computing group at the MIT Media Lab. Um, it started with a few of Marvin Minsky's students trying to work with natural language data. And uh, Marvin Minsky says, well, what can computers do with language if they don't even know things like, like fire is hot? Um, like, you know, if you can't relate words in the way that people do, uh, then you're just pushing around arbitrary symbols and not understanding anything. You've got, you know, if you want words to mean things, you have to know how those meanings relate to each other. And so, uh, 
the students started working on this problem. One of the students was Catherine Avesi, who is our CEO, and they worked on the problem of giving computers common sense. Uh, just because um, this was an early crowdsourcing project, it actually started before Wikipedia did, um, and just you know ask people questions uh, to collect common knowledge about the world. Um, and so here is like a screenshot of things that knew about soup, and they could use that uh, and use some uh, simple machine learning to uh, ask people for follow-up questions to fill in gaps in this knowledge. Um, and you know, some of these statements are you know highly relevant. Some of them are kind of weird. You had to learn that this uh, this guy the Doom would, would contribute a whole lot of information, but some of it is a little bit weird. <laughs> um, we hooked up to, to Verbosity, which uh, was one of the Carnegie Mellon games with a purpose, uh, and they had a, uh, basically a word game that was kind of like Taboo, where um, it was collecting the clues that people used um, as common sense knowledge. And uh, this, you know, this worked pretty well, and it's, this got us started with a knowledge base, um, and this all ran during what I consider the golden age of crowdsourcing, when you could like get a crowdsource project going just by asking people, um, like you just said, "Hey, you want to help this AI learn things?" and people would say yes. Um, and 4chan didn't exist yet, so there so there wasn't like a big organized you know uh, group of trolls who were going to mess you up. Um, um, and so if you run it now, you have to deal with trolling, and um, you know the crowdsour crowdsourcing has become this commodity that you have to get on Mechanical Turk. And people aren't motivated by actually helping the system anymore. They're motivated by making money as fast as possible. So crowdsourcing, you know, it, it, I feel like we had the right timing there. But crowdsourcing is uh, a lot more difficult now. But so we're collecting all this information. We need to have a good representation of it. And so started putting that together into uh, this representation called ConceptNet. Um, this is around where I joined the group. Uh, and I ended up taking over maintenance of ConceptNet. So all the things people uh, all the things that people have told the system can be put together into this knowledge graph, and the different kinds of statements people put in can be generalized into these relations, like you know, is a and part of and receives action and things like that. Um, and so, so we started building this knowledge graph, and uh, I started expanding it to cover other languages, and we started collaborating with you know groups around the world to uh, collect good crowdsourced data in these other languages. Um, and uh, so we got this representation, and then the question is, well, you still got this big sparse view of what words mean. How do you use that? How do you learn from it? And we started doing some principal component analysis to it, and word vectors come out. <coughs> these vectors you can compare to each other, and vectors that are kind of similar to each other are words that kind of mean the same thing. Um, and this was a pretty cool idea that like, nobody believed at the time that it should actually work. Um, except, you know, suddenly around 2013, everybody started making word vectors. Um, so we were in the opposition, we had already started Luminoso, we were in the opposition of, like, suddenly everybody wants to do what we do. So, and, and people are making, you know, uh, NLP papers with diagrams like this. Um, and so this is, this is where deep learning comes in. But, you know, then probably the most successful output of deep learning in NLP is the idea that you can train a system on something and then just kind of slice it right here and take out the, that vector representation you get for every word. And that's something you can apply to other problems. And you know, it's something that you, can, uh, that you can reuse and even if you're not using it for what it was originally outputting. And so like a typical system like WordDevec involves, uh, you have a system that's designed for um, predicting what a word in a sentence is going to be. In the end, you're not using it for predicting what a word in a sentence is going to be. But the fact that it learned to predict that means that it's got this uh, representation of words as vectors. And so this stuff showed up, and it was a little better idea than the principal component analysis that we've been using. So we started, so we started replacing it, uh, what we did gradually with this, and found that uh, the stuff, the information that we had from ConceptNet and the information we get from, uh, from these word embeddings uh, actually fit together really well to produce something that was more powerful than either of them alone. And so I'll get back to that idea later. Um, but I've got this next uh, topic here, which is comparing what you learn about NLP, uh, like at MIT or something, um, and what's actually important in NLP from our point of view. 
Um, so uh, you learn about you know the sequence of things you need to do to your text. Uh, you start by tokenizing it. You're splitting into words. Sometimes that's easy because there's spaces. Sometimes that's a little harder because you have to separate punctuation and abbreviations and stuff. Sometimes that's way harder because it's Japanese and they don't use spaces. Um, uh, you know, you got to reduce words to their to their stems. Uh, You've got to tag parts of speech. Maybe you have to build parse trees to understand the actual structure of the sentence. Uh, and then there's fancier things like name and recognition, like you know, if you see the phrase New York Times, you want to rec recognize that as one thing. And you know, added kind of belatedly onto the list is the idea that you want to be able to produce word vectors for all of these things. And you know, some of these steps are things that we do, but uh, here's kind of our view of what's important. Uh, for one thing. Uh, we avoid parsing as much as possible because parsing is really slow and really inaccurate still. Um, but you know, you see, you, you see things reported for parsers like you know, 95% accuracy, and that means that uh, one out of every 20 words is going to be wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, so your chance of getting a complete sentence that is analyzed correctly is not that high. Um, so. Uh, uh, so it, as much as you can get away with not parsing, uh, everything just works better. Um, name and recognition uh, involves, you know, uh, you know, often involves like having this, you know, big uh, lookup dictionary of people and organizations and uh, things like that, and it's generally targeted at uh, things that have entries on Wikipedia or at least Wikidata or something. And when you end up working with actual text in a particular domain, there is all kinds of Entities that you're not going to know about beforehand, like you know, um, you know, the entity you may, might need to know about is you know one particular person who works in customer service, or you know one particular product this company just put out, um, and uh, and sometimes you know there's phrases that are not named entities that are still important, like the phrase customer service, or you know. Um, the, the, uh, Variations on the phrase, it didn't come with the right kind of plug, uh, things like that. Um, so we solved a different problem and call it relevant phrase recognition. Um, you've got to find the phrases that seem to be statistically interesting, whether or not they're named entities. Um, word vectors are important. Um, they, uh, and I'll talk about the fact that you know you want to be able to make domain-specific word vectors without having to Assume that you know your specific domain is like that, that all the text you've ever seen is in this domain. You have to be able to take these vectors that know about everything, uh, that know a little bit about everything, and make them into vectors that know a lot about something. And and I'm also talking about common sense background knowledge, which is having those vectors that know a little bit about everything. Um, one thing I didn't put on here, but I just remembered, you know, is kind of a step is uh, word census ambiguation, which is considered an academically really important task. And uh, we've looked at it a little bit and kind of found that it's one of those things that, uh, you know, as Brendan said, is not a customer pain point. Like, if you've got the right specific word vectors, uh, that's prob then you probably actually solved the problem that would have been solved by, uh, named by um, word sense disambiguation. Uh, like, the word bank has multiple meanings, but uh, in the finance industry, it only has one meaning that's relevant, so you're all set. Yeah. Um, and so, then there's a bunch of other fiddly things that you need to deal with, uh, you know, once you're really doing this. Uh, like the fact that everyone's data is coming from Excel, uh, and you have to be able to deal with what Excel did to it. Um, <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's data cleaning in general, like a lot of data sets have spam in them, or have the same document like 20 times, or 2,000 times. Uh, that you have to be able to cope with misspellings. Um, you have to be able to cope with some of it, like some of it being in the wrong language. Um, uh, there is types of text that might not have been in your standard corpus, like you know, emoticons and emoji. Um, you have to have some good tricks to avoid parsing. You know, I say we avoid parsing as much as possible. But you know, um, if someone said, if one person is saying this is, you know. This product is good, and another person is saying this product is not very good. Um, you still want to understand that the thing that it's not is good. Like you know, that not very good is the opposite of good. Um, and so you have to be able to at least figure out these shallow things, like 
what does this word not seem to be applied to? Um, you have to deal with unfamiliar vocabulary uh, because sometimes that's the, that's the most interesting thing that's being talked about is the words that you didn't expect to see. And you have to have a good visualization of all this, and that gets, gets into this rapid iteration thing. People want to understand what the system learned about their data. And, you know, back to the academic view of things. Uh, I looked at, uh, uh, I looked at one system that, you know, basically just said in this reading, hey, we're trained on both kinds of data, views and Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, occasionally you see, you see other things, but there's really a lot more kinds of data than that. And so, uh, our sources of text tend to be product reviews, customer feedback, social media, chat, We've done a little bit with understanding like scientific papers coming out. Uh, YouTube comments are an interesting, wonderfully messy set of data that, in particular, people don't want to read and would rather have a computer read. You know, um, <laughs> uh, you know uh, speech and text transcripts are you know a uh, really convenient way to get data, but it means that uh, means that your uh, system has to be able to deal with text where every once in a while a word is replaced with unrelated word, um, stuff like that. And uh, I kind of uh, grayed out news there because um, as important as news might seem, the thing is that the news industry has bigger problems right now, and they uh, uh, they aren't really in the market for uh, text understanding. They, they, they've got bigger things to focus on. So uh, so when you look at, say, a paper in academia, you know, this is what NLP looks like. You take this, you know, the sentence of you know of news and you label the organizations and the people and the locations and, and stuff like that. Um, and what text looks like to us is more like this. Um, so here we took the reviews for this uh, horse head mask on Amazon. Um, you know, we, often, uh, we, 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 we often get example projects just by scraping all the reviews for something from Amazon. Um, and uh, we can make this uh, word cloud-like visualization out of it. Um, you know, people like you know word clouds as a visualization, and, but there's this problem with most word clouds. Like, I, so there's a you know word cloud even out there. There's this problem with most word clouds, which is that there's a lot of uh, dimensions of information that uh, actually just don't mean anything in a word cloud. Like in a typical word cloud, the position of something doesn't matter, the color doesn't matter. Um, we so we made a more powerful visual, visualization by making those things matter. Uh, we grouped together words with similar meaning in the same, in similar places in the word cloud, um, and you know, topics that you've identified as interesting topics are things that are these similar colors. Um, and the size of the word is not just how many times the word is said, but how many times the word is said compared to how many times you would have expected it to be said in general through the language. Uh, so our goal here is to use this idea of a word cloud that people are generally sort of familiar with, but use it to provide more information. And uh, maybe you can like you know click around in the word cloud. I'll show you a demo in a bit. You can click around the word cloud and pull up snippets where these things are being talked about. Um, there's another example of a, of, of a word cloud visualization. Uh, we had one uh, last winter during flu season where we uh, collected tweets from people who have the flu. Um, very often, this uh, feeling is expressed through emoji. Uh, so we just make sure that uh, emoji works right in the word cloud. Um, and so you, know, you have to be able to deal with phrases like you know uh, killer headache and you know still have a headache and getting sick and throat hurts so bad and things like that. Um, and so we we we, uh, we got an article in Wired and this uh, this visualization you know you know became an image in the article and we were looking at the article and someone asked why does it say ass headache over there on the right? <laughs> what is an ass headache? Uh, you have to kind of be able to you know. You know, phase up to the to the uh, failures and the imperfections of your system, and so this was you know the uh, relevant phrase detection going slightly wrong. Uh, you know, people would say, you know, man, I got this big ass headache. Big right? <laughs> <laughs> ass headache, and like the generalization, I clearly ass headache. <laughs> so uh, we all had a good laugh about that. Um, and uh, I was talking about you know. You have to be able to cope with different languages. Uh, there's 12 languages that we focus on, um, and you know we'll keep expanding to more. But this has covered a lot of customer needs so far. We just have to make sure that our pipeline does not make assumptions that are specific to English. And we have to make sure 
to test it with people who are native speakers of different languages and make sure that the results they're getting make sense. Uh, so at this point, I can go on to a demo of our analytic project. Um, so, yeah, so here is, we've got a kind of low resolution display here, but uh, we built this, uh, this project from the reviews on Yelp of the different uh, restaurants and eating establishments around Central Square, which is where our office is. Uh, so this is a project that's uh, pretty relevant to us. Um, <laughs> and so you get this visualization of the different things that people can be saying. Uh, you, people can be talking about the particular foods and ingredients. People can be talking about the service or the atmosphere. Um, people can be you know, generally talking about their, their, their opinion of the place. Um, and so there's different topics you can sort out, and uh, so uh, sometimes we're asked, like, so is what you do sentiment analysis? And uh, we see sentiment analysis as one specific case of what we do, which is identifying these topics and finding <coughs> particular documents aligned with topics. And so um, we find it more interesting than sentiment analysis because there can be like multiple kinds of sentiment going on. Like it's not just positive versus negative. Um, like you can have sentiment that's particularly about the taste of the food, or you can have sentiment that is about you know, uh, you know the experience in general. Um, you, you can you know, you, you can be you know, you can be disgusted by the food, or you can just be disappointed by it. Those are different. Those are different sentiments. But uh, we can identify these different topics and. Um, to make this process as um, as quick as possible, um, a topic to us can be identified by as little as a single word. Uh, we just generalize from there by understanding from your text and from your background data uh, which words are similar to each other. And so um, we've got this topic that is expensive, and we know that, that this also includes pricey and overpriced and costly and things like that. Um, and if you're looking at uh, service, and someone's saying slow, and then they're also talking about the service. You know, uh, you're looking for the atmosphere, and then you're also talking about the ambiance, um, things like that. Uh, and so, so you got this word cloud. This is not just a static word cloud. We can, uh, ref we've got these word vectors. They have lots of dimensions to them. We have to kind of smash them down to two dimensions on the screen, but we can reflow it to show what we're, what we're interested in. Uh, so. Let's put awesomeness on the y-axis here, and I guess we'll put price on the x-axis. And um, so now we've got this different view. Um, trying to unselect so we get back to the colors here. Uh, we've got this, this different view of things, and so uh, words like cozy and friendly have gone up towards the top, and fantastic is up even higher. Um, uh, so actually, you know, what we've got on the right here is uh, things that uh, generally relate to the price um, and things that are about different topics such as like the food and the, the menu options are, are on the left. Um, and uh, so we can use this for something like um, uh, we can look at what the uh, word, uh, what the concept cloud is for a particular place. Um, so let's look at, for example, Andala Coffee House. And so that's going to focus on just the terms that people use when talking about this particular uh, restaurant. And uh, now up here at the top, we've got, you know, what's, what is amazing or what is awesome about the Umbella Coffee House? And it's, you know, it's cozy, it's the ambiance, it's things like that. Um, and uh, pick something else, uh, Toskies. And, you know, what is awesome? It's, you know, uh, it's the, the, you know, the, the Belgian something or other. Um, we'll find out what that is. Uh, Belgian chocolate. Yep. Um, things like that. Um, and uh, we can also see this. So you can see it by restaurant. You can also see it uh, by by rating. And you know, you get kind of. Uh, what you expect from this, you know, if you look at the rating one, then you start to see you're pulling out words like, you know, rude and disgusting, uh, and, you know, um, you know, at rating three, you get uh, words where, like, you know, you know, kind of 
you know, mildly positive, like friend, friendly, or mildly negative, like you know, disappointed or pricey, and you know, by you know, words. Um, and you know, there are all kinds of ways to view this data. Um, here's a view that would work better if I had a larger screen because we're getting all the restaurant names cut off. Um, but uh, um, you can see uh, with these color-coded topics, you can see how each of these uh, how each of these restaurant scores on the different topics. Um, and how each of these subset scores on different topics. So, you know, you can tell clearly there is very little awesomeness going on down here at, rate, at rating one. Um, but uh, you can also look at all, all of these things. Like, what are these, uh, what are these uh, different uh, places that people think can be awesome but not delicious, um, where just being delicious has nothing to do with it? Um, and these are, you know, the People's Republic, the Flower Stars, these are, these are bars. Like, <laughs> Or the Middle East, like you don't like the the, the tastiness is not the point. Um, <laughs> um, what, what, you know, here's one where service is far and away the most important thing, um, and that's of course Starbucks. Like once again, like it, it, it you know everyone knows what their you know latte with uh, syrup in is going to taste like. Um, it's the, the the only thing they're really to review is the service. Um, uh, you've got you know. New restaurants, you know, this was interesting. Interestingly polarized reviews of uh, of mainly burgers. It's delicious and awesome, but also disappointing. You have also disappointing with different people. Um, and so you make all kinds of comparisons like that, and like you can export this stuff to Excel. If you have geographic, if there's a different kind of data set, you know, people might be exporting geographic data to a visualization system like Tableau, so they can see, you know, <coughs> geographic clusters of uh, of these statistics that are that are coming out of your text, and so that's uh, the kind of thing that Luminoso, that our main product, Luminoso Analytics, does. So Luminoso was, you know, built on this crowdsourced data that people provided us for free. We'd kind of be jerks if we took that and like closed it all up. Uh, so we make sure to keep uh, as much as we can of our data of, of our data open. And so our general approach here is. This uh, our space of background knowledge, uh, the stuff that doesn't come from any particular customer, we open up that as much as possible. And so, return to ConceptNet uh, here. Um, we continue to maintain, con maintain ConceptNet. It's no longer really an MIT project. We maintain it here at Luminoso. Um, I recently put up a new interface that you can use for browsing ConceptNet at conceptnet.io. Uh, you can just follow links between the terms, you know, they're grouped by the different kinds of relations it knows about it, um, and it links between all the different languages that ConceptNet understands. Um, and it's also got a new uh, uh, linked data API. Um, you know, we've had this REST API up for, for a while, but uh, I think it's compatible with the uh, JSON LD standard uh, because, you know, ConceptNet gets a lot of its data now from interlinking with other resources like open multilingual WordNet and stuff. Um, it's kind of like that the one core idea of the semantic web that actually worked. Um, and now there's a format for it that, uh, that Google is pushing, pushing pretty hard called JSON-LD. And so with all these other like RGF formats that have kind of fallen by the wayside, people are actually using JSON-LD uh, for things. Uh, and things are actually becoming APIs that are reasonable to use and interoperable because of that. And so now I've got this new API up that, that uh, can pull out information from ConceptNet. And uh, I didn't make a slide for this, but I can uh, show it. You can use, you can query this API for uh, related, to like write terms by relating this to a particular term. So uh, I can look at Bicycle and ask what are the most related terms. Well, we get things in a bunch of different languages. So uh, I made a different query trying to filter for English and query, you can see that you know, all these different terms, including, you know, a misspelling of bicycle and, you know, bike and, and all those kinds of things. Uh, these are all, these are all related to it. Um, and so, uh, what kinds of places are these word vectors coming from uh, in this world where now there's all kinds of, you know, new research in word vectors? The general approach to word vectors that, uh, uh, independently of concept net that most people would take is using distributional semantics, uh, with words that being the well-known but slightly dated example. Um, 
So, you know, it's, it, when, when you talk about this regional semantics, you're pretty much required to quote uh, linguist J.R. Firth here, who said you shall know a word by the company it repeats, uh, even though in a different publication he said, like, almost exactly the opposite. So, <laughs> um, but the idea is, uh, you know, you, you, you look at a word, you look at the, the words around it, you either try to predict the word from the word around it, words around it, or predict the words around it from the word. Um, and as you're doing this, you're learning about how words are related to each other. Um, Except there is, there is a slight uh, line spot that this has, um, which is that what you're learning is which words can replace each other in context. Um, and that mostly tells you about similarities in meaning, but not entirely. Um, as I started looking into this, I started uh, noticing that uh, certain words were being treated as interchangeable with other words, and that was sometimes kind of you know, very unfortunate, especially um, when a word that I consider uh, Red Sox to be nearly a synonym of Yankees. Um, <laughs> And, you know, you can think of other examples like, you know, high school and elementary. So what I was doing here is I was looking at, at uh, phrases, uh, and I was looking at a version of the system that only had single words in it and finding what's the closest single word uh, with and without content in the system. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, and, and so uh, on this side, you get something that, you know, very, you know, clearly could replace it in a lot of sentences, but it's often not quite the same thing. Um, and so if you have a knowledge graph, then you have a little bit more information about that, that relates words by their meaning independently of the context that they appear in. And that's the that extra information that you need to understand that if you want to see a single word representing Red Sox, you should pick Sox and not Yankees. <laughs> so I'm saying that this is, uh, that when you use concept maps, that this is better than something off the shelf like word to deck alone. How would I prove this? Um, and so one kind of evaluation of a semantic space um, is uh, this, uh, word, this kind of word relatedness uh, evaluation. You have a list of pairs of words, and there's been like, you know, a bunch of people have been surveyed either through crowdsourcing or through paying a bunch of undergraduates a small amount of money or whatever um, <laughs> to uh, rank these pairs of words by their similarity. And so an example of an evaluation that you'd come in words and say, uh, you want to make sure that beach versus coast are the most related, Bacon versus salad are kind of related in that they're both foods, but they're not very similar kinds of foods. Pub versus kitten don't have a lot in common at all, so you probably want to make this, this ranking. Uh, the idea is that your algorithm should output the same ranking of similarity that people do. And you, know, you can also uh, focus on uh, more rare words. Uh, so, you know, knowing that, you know, autofocus and optical are more similar to each other than confluence and branch are. And uh, that kind of test makes sure that you're robust enough to be able to deal with uh, different domains. Um, and there's another kind of evaluation, uh, which is to solve analogy questions. Um, and I find a great source of analogy questions to be uh, old SAT tests. Um, and there has been research into solving this particular kind of question going back to long before uh, the, the phrase word embedding was around. Um, uh, actually, now a bunch of word embedding systems are using this much more limited set of analogy questions that Google put out. Um, and I occasionally test on those, but I find them not to be nearly as interesting in, in the kinds of questions they're asking as uh, as these SAT questions. And so, um, so you get you have a word pair like remuneration and labor, and you have to identify what is the relationship there, and what pair of words has the same relationship. And yeah, and this is kind of the cool thing about word vectors is that they can encode these relationships even without any explicit representation of that. Um, and so. Um, Relation is that uh, your A is what you get for B, and so trophy and victory is the, is the right answer there. Uh, and so if you've got a system that has a good enough representation of words as vectors, then it should be able to make that kind of comparison and get the right answer a reasonable amount of the time. And so um, if you put together a system of distributional semantics with the knowledge graph of concept net, uh, you end up with something that is way more powerful than either of them alone. And that's the orange bars here. Um, try on these four evaluations of word similarity. Uh, I didn't cherry pick these evaluations or just do better on any evaluation I tried. And these are the ones that I could find comparable results for all these <coughs> systems, including word to vec, um, uh, Glove, which is one of those systems that looked at what word to vec was doing and said, okay, how can we do that quicker uh, without all the deep learning going on? Um, and a couple of more recently published systems, including one called LexVec and uh, Facebook's FastTech, which really is a, a, a nice program. Um, 
very useful um, and does a little better at distributional can be used for both distributional semantics and for classification. And when you for distributional distributional semantics, it's a little a little faster and a little better than the um, And we outperform all of those. And so we published the system. Uh, it's going to be a paper in AAAI in February. And uh, there's kind of this thing where when you make an uh, academic artifact like this, you have to give it a silly name. Um, and so we were making jokes about, you know, variations on the name of uh, Benedict Cumberbatch around the office, and ended up calling our system ConceptNet Numberbatch. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so that's uh, one thing. You can, you can go get those word vectors. Um, there's, you know, I, I still see more improvements that can be made to it. So, like, we can make it deal better with, uh, with out of vocabulary words. You know, uh, deal better with non-English languages. Um, there are some non-English word vectors in there that it learned from ConceptNet, but uh, there's probably more that could be done there. And, but you know, even so, we thought we're you know error bars above the rest of the systems, and it's kind of graph that people would usually not even put error bars on because it would be too you know depressing. Uh, um, I'll just talk about a couple of other things that we've uh, produced uh, that are op our open source projects at Luminoso. Um, this one's a pretty straightforward one. It's called Word Freak. Uh, this is, uh, you know, kind of an in intro to NLP project is to take a corpus and collect the word frequencies from it. Um, and a lot of people stop there and say, like, hey, I just ran over all the Wikipedia. Here, here are the frequencies of words. Um, but then you just learn that, like, census is one of the most amazingly common words in the English language because, like, you know, half the articles on Wikipedia are the census data from some town that has 10 people living in it. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, if you want to actually be able to recognize uh, which words are interesting and which words are unexpected, uh, then you have to be able to cover a lot more uh, different kinds of text. And so we went looking for a good variety of, of text where we could collect a, you know, a representative amount of, a lot of representative text uh, in different languages. And so you can get this from Wikipedia, uh, from the Common Crawl, which is uh, you know, just a, a web crawl that uh, has a data set you can get on AWS. Um, going to the data corpus of all the Reddit comments from 2008 through 2015. Uh, Twitter is a kind of tricky one because you're not allowed to distribute the data, but you are allowed to have a process that just listens to the sample of, of uh, Twitter, and so you just have to kind of run that process for a while. Uh, we did that. Um, open subtitles is a really cool data set that is growing all the time. Uh, it's, you know, just take all the subtitles from uh, from like TV shows and from DVDs and stuff and make them into a corpus. Uh, that's a great way to get colloquial language in a lot of different languages. Uh, and of course, Google Books. And you know, so we put this together, found all the languages where we had enough data, and got uh, you know, pretty robust ranking of word frequencies in 27 different languages. So this is a, a Python module that uh, you can just go get. And we've got a pretty nice, compact representation, so it's not going to just download things forever. Um, a problem we had to solve and then made an open source uh, module out of it so that maybe it doesn't have to be solved again uh, is dealing with language codes. Um, like, how do you tell the computer that something is, uh, is in English? Um, turns out that there is like, there's a standard for this uh, you know, that you're supposed to follow, and then there's a lot of people who just make stuff up. Um, and uh, uh, we can take, and then there's a bunch of older standards. Um, so dealing, dealing with this kind of stuff, Sometimes you need to be able to recognize a language by its name. Sometimes you need to be able to uh, recognize different variations of a language code. Anyway, um, all this kind of stuff we dealt with and made into a module. Um, and then here is the an, an interesting, uh, you know, kind of nitty gritty case of dealing with real world text. So there's Mojibake. Um, it's everywhere. Mojibake <laughs> is uh, when you take uh, text. And encode it in one version of uh, in one encoding of Unicode and decode it with another, and end up getting the wrong text out. And so you might see this. Uh, if you've dealt with a lot of text before, you might see the sequence of like a hat euro sign trademark sign and just feel this feeling of dread, um, <laughs> that means that your data is, is screwed. Um, and what was interesting is that like the sequence of garbage characters uh, actually contained enough information to figure out what the text should have been. And so we started working on uh, fixing that problem. And this was like a necessity for us because 
Um, <coughs> so much customer data has has Moji Vodka in it, and you don't want to just like you, you don't want like your assigned trademark to be a term a term in your space. And you can't just like go tell your customer, hey, hey, you messed up your trademark, uh, because that's that's frustrating. It's when it's possible to just fix it for them. Um, just got a couple more examples here. Um, great place to collect Moji Vodka is on Twitter because even though Twitter only has one encoding, which is UTF-8, a bunch of clients still manage to do it wrong. wrong <laughs> so we just got a big trial work. Um, and here's an amazing case of Moji Vodka uh, where someone uh, mailed a package to Russia and you know dutifully wrote down what their friend said their address was uh, in their email, um, which. which Showed up in their email as this, and uh, <laughs> some Russian postal worker actually figured out what was going on and translated it and managed to deliver the package. Um, but uh, most people do not have the patience of that uh, Russian <laughs> postal worker. <laughs> um, so yeah, but here's here's what's going on. You've got you know a, a standard everyday word like mas, it's a Spanish word, um, and so. You, you know, M and S are totally normal ASCII characters, they'll be fine. But this A with an accent, uh, the way we represent that now in regional systems is that we represent it with, with these two bytes. Um, but then there's a bunch of older software that assumes that each byte is its own character. Uh, that's the older like Windows 1252 standard. Uh, or you might end up with a different standard if, you're, if your Windows computer comes from a different country. Um, and so it ends up being decoded as, as, you know, uh, as these characters which are not exactly the right ones. Uh, but, you know, we can detect, we can often detect this happening in the reversal process. You might think this is a machine learning problem. And I tried some machine learning, and it's actually just a problem of, like, having a bunch of good heuristics. Uh, because the problem with the machine learning approach here is, for one thing, it's kind of that, like, you know, th that problem with having imbalanced data, you know, very rare positives. Um, uh, I would say that about, well, you know, if it takes in the wild, maybe like one out of 5,000 documents is corrupted like this, unless Excel is involved in the process, in which case it's like one out of two. But um, <laughs> I'm serious about Excel. Like, Excel does not understand what UTF-8 is, and, and people have to deal with Unicode with it anyway, and it's a big mess. Um, and so much of our data comes from Excel, we just have to be able to deal with that. Um, and so this is an important problem uh, to solve, I think, in general, and I want more people to be able to solve it. Uh, we downloaded the Globe word embeddings and found that they had actually spent a lot of time learning the wrong things about words because there was this big moji bucket problem with their input. Uh, we told the Globe team about this, and a couple months later they released Globe 1.2, which was really a lot better uh, just from fixing that bug. Um, there's Semivel competitions, which are these bake offs of semantic systems, where for multiple years they were evaluating on Twitter data, where the downloading script for the Twitter data was was corrupting all the data. Uh, so people's systems just had to be able to deal with that, and they 